Okay, good morning, everyone. Nice to see you again for this second day of the virtual training on the SDG 241. We have some new participants today that were not able to attend the sessions yesterday, or they did only partially. So first of all, let me again introduce quickly myself. My name is Stefania Bacci. I am a statistician working in the statistics division or FAO headquarter, and I am the facilitator of this uh, virtual training. So whatever issue you have, you can count on me. Mr. Arbab Aspandeyar Khan is uh, uh, an economist working also in the statistics division FAO headquarter and he will be your leading resource person for this uh, virtual training. We have also behind the scene uh, Mrs. Alda Elizabeth Diaz Cavallo, uh, advisor for calculation of the SDG indicators uh, from FAO Regional Office uh, Latin American and Caribbean. She's helping during these uh, three days sessions to translate for me in English all the questions that the participants are writing in Spanish in the chat box. She has done a gorgeous, gorgeous job yesterday. Uh, we have had a so active sessions. So before starting, I would like to recap uh, quickly what we have uh, learned yesterday. So we have seen the 21 SDG indicators that are under the FAO custodianship. And we have focused, of course, on the SDG 241. Uh, we have seen in general its background, the scope, periodicity, and other, and so on. And finally, we have, we have moved uh, to the framework, uh, which is the core content of this training. We have seen in details the first dimension, which is the economic dimension. And it has been a very interesting day full of content and many doubts have been uh, clarified through the questions and answer session. Yesterday, we didn't have time to go through all the sessions originally scheduled. So we, will, we have readapted the agenda of today to fit all of them. Therefore, we need to squeeze a bit the plan for today and we will skip a, a couple of presentations, but I will tell you uh, quickly about them later or tomorrow, let's see. So today, uh, we will see the remaining two dimensions. We will see the, uh, the two for one data collection questionnaires. And a colleague from Statistics Canada will illustrate their experience uh, in the SDG two for one reporting. Okay. So can you, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, perfect. So the first sub indicator in the environmental dimension is prevalence of soil degradation. Uh, in the context of 241, we have selected uh, four main threats to soil health that are universal across the globe. At least that's what came up in our discussions with the, with the experts. So um, the theme for this indicator is, uh, is soil health. The coverage for this uh, indicator is all farm types. And the reference period is last three calendar years. So the four main threats that we have considered in the context of 241 are uh, fairly universal, soil erosion, reduction in soil fertility, salinization, water logging, and other, like say, for example, there would be many countries for which, you know, the four threats that we have listed here may not be relevant. So in that context, they can drop the one which is irrelevant for them and, you know, pick another one which is uh, relevant in the con country context. So uh, uh, in case of 241, uh, a simple question is asked in a farm survey to capture the farmer's knowledge or declaration about the situation of agriculture holding in terms of soil degradation. Um, so in terms of sustainability threshold, this is how we, we, we structured it. So we classify the farm and its associated area as green. If the combined area affected by any of the four selected threats to soil, uh, to soil health is less than 10% of the total agriculture area of the farm. So um, if 
if any of the threat is affecting less than 10% of the agriculture area of the farm, uh, then we will consider that uh, um, that farm as green. Uh, for yellow, the combined area affected by any of the four selected threats to soil health is between 10 to 50 percent. Then we will classify the farm and its, its associated agriculture area as yellow. And if the combined area affected by any of the four selected threats to soil health is above 50 percent um, of the agriculture land area of the farm, then we will classify it as red. So it's very simple. I mean, we have uh, three questions in the survey questionnaire that I will show you in my next presentation. And using those questions, you can, you can easily collect information on, uh, on, um, on all these aspects to classify the farm according to the traffic light approach. So this is again the Bangladesh example, uh, the pilot test that we, con we conducted in 2018 and 19. So from this example, uh, as you can see here, um, the holding one uh, replied that we don't have any soil erosion on our, on our um, farm. Yes, there was reduction in, in soil fertility. There was uh, water logging observed or experienced by the farmer, and there was no salinization. The total agriculture area of that particular farm was 0.9 hectares. The total agriculture area affected that was reported by the farmer to the questions that we have asked was 0.4. So if we uh, calculate this percentage simply by dividing the total agriculture area affected by the, the total agriculture land area of the farm, the percentage area affected is 45. As it falls between 10 and 50%, we classify this farm as yellow or acceptable. Uh, let me uh, uh, give you another example. So holding three, they mentioned that do, they don't have any problem as for uh, soil degradation is concerned on their, uh, on, 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 on its holding. So they, they said, they replied no to all the questions. The total agriculture area of the farm was uh, 0.2 hectares. Of course, none of the area was affected by any of this threat, and hence we classify this as desirable because if it is less than 10% of the total agriculture area of the farm, uh, the problematic area, then we classify it as green. And likewise, in this case, as you can see, this holding mentioned that they have soil erosion and reduction in soil fertility as two major threats experienced uh, on the farm. The total agriculture area of the farm was 0.27 hectares. The total area affected by these two threats was 0 0.20 hectare, which is 74% of the total agriculture area. And hence we classify this farm as, as uh, red or non-sustainable. Now, once we, again, the last step for all the sub indicators remain the same. We add up the agriculture areas by green, yellow, and red statuses. We aggregate those. And then we divide it by the nationally representative agriculture area of the entire country to calculate the proportion of the uh, agriculture area by traffic light approach. Okay, so the second sub indicator in the framework of um, two for one in the environmental dimension is variation in water availability. The theme is water use. The coverage is all farm types and the reference period is last three calendar years. Now, agriculture, more specifically irrigated agriculture is by far the main economic sector that use fresh water resources. In many places, uh, water withdrawal from, from rivers um, and groundwater aquifers is beyond what can be considered environmentally sustainable, which affects both rivers and uh, groundwater resources. Sustainable agriculture therefore requires that the level uh, of use of fresh water for irrigation remain within acceptable boundaries. Um, now, Having said that, there is no internationally agreed standard of water use sustainability. 
Um, signals associated with unsustainable use of water typically, typically include progressive reduction in the level of groundwater and drying out of springs and rivers. So um, though we don't have any objective standard to uh, measure sustainability of water use, but then we can take some um, indications as to as to how it is um, uh, doing in terms of uh, in terms of uh, uh, its reduction. Um, the sub, this sub indicator captures the extent to which agriculture contributes to unsustainable patterns of uh, of water use. So in terms of uh, in terms of the thresholds that we have um, um, came up with to assign green, yellow, and red statuses to the agriculture holding and the agriculture land area that it owns, manages, and operates. So the farm will be classified as green. Um, if the water availability remain stable over the years for farms irrigating crops on more than 10% of its agriculture area. Um, the farms will be automatically classified as green if they are irrigating less than 10% of uh, uh, their agriculture area with water. So what, what, what it means is that basically here we are uh, assessing the impact of agriculture on the environment. So if a farm is not using any water for irrigation or less than 10% of it, its agriculture area for irrigation, then by default, it's not contributing to the imbalance or reduction of water in the ground level, and hence it will be classified as green. Now the farm will be classified as yellow. If uh, it uses water to irrigate crop on more than 10% of its agriculture area, and he doesn't know whether the water availability remain stable over the years, or experience reduction in water availability over the years, but there are no organization that effectively allocate water amongst the users. And the farm will be classified as uh, red if um, the farmer use water to irrigate um, at least 10% of its agriculture area of the farm, does not know whether the water availability remains stable over the years, um, or experience reduction on water availability over the years, but there is no organization that effectively allocate water. So red is all other cases. So uh, just to exemplify uh, for the Bangladesh test that we carried out in 2018-19, holding one, they mentioned um, in answer to our question that we asked in a survey, they mentioned that no, we are not using, uh, no water is always available in sufficient quantity. Area irrigated is uh, approximately 90% and hence we classify it as green or desirable. So if we go back. So the first condition is water availability remains stable over the years for the farm irrigating crops on more than 10% of the agriculture area. So if you are using water on more than 10% of your area, but the water availability remains stable, you are automatically classified as green. The second, we asked, was there a reduction in water availability? The farmer says, yes. Water in my wells is progressively going down. So the follow-up question was, are there organization dealing with water allocation in your area? And the farmer says yes, and they are working well. So the total area irrigated by this um, holding was 71%. Um, and because of these two conditions, we, we classify it as yellow or acceptable. And the third one, they said, yes, water, is, uh, water in my wells is progressively going down and there are no organization uh, that efficiently allocate water in my area. They, the holding irrigates 74% of uh, its area with water and hence we classify it as unsustainable. The last step remains the same. We aggregate the 
farms and the associated agriculture area that are classified green, yellow, and red. And then we calculate uh, the, the proportions uh, using the traffic light approach. So are there any questions? Yes, but uh, I'm still waiting for the Spanish translation. So I don't know if you want to go on while Alda is still translating. Okay. So the third sub-indicator in the environmental dimension is uh, management of uh, fertilizer. In the context of 2 for 1, sustainable agriculture implies that the level of chemicals in the soil and water bodies remains within the acceptable thresholds. The theme for this uh, sub-indicator is fertilizer risk. The coverage is all farm types and the reference period for this sub-indicator is last calendar year. Now, this sub-indicator is constructed using data collected through a set of questions, again, asked to, asked to the farmers um, about their use of fertilizer, and particularly the synthetic or mineral fertilizers, animal manure and slurry, about their awareness of the environmental risks associated with the use of fertilizers, and their behavior in terms of plant nutrient management. So these are eight measures that we propose as best practices that the farmer um, uh, needs to um, have or adhere to uh, on its agriculture land area. And based on um, how many of these are practiced by the farmer, we then assign the green, yellow, and red statuses to the agriculture holding. Now, I'm not going to go through each measure separately. Um, all these measures that are listed here have been um, uh, decided in, uh, in discussion with the, the relevant experts on fertilizers. Um, and all these are explained in the, both in the enumerator manual, the definitions uh, of, uh, of um, all these um, all these measures, as well um, uh, in the in the data analysis uh, guidelines that we will that we will uh, show to the uh, participants later on. So, so of these eight measures, if the farmer is using fertilizer, but is taking at least four specific measures to mitigate environmental risks. Then the farm will be classified as green. If the farmer is not using any fertilizer, then by default, we will consider that farm as, uh, as sustainable or green. So there are two conditions uh, for green. One is if the farm is not using any fertilizer. And second, if the farm is using fertilizer by taking four specific measures. Um, the holding or the agriculture holding will be classified as yellow if the farm uses fertilizer and is taking at least two measures to mitigate environmental risks. And lastly, the farm uses fertilizer and does not take any of the specific measures listed on the previous slide to mitigate environmental risk, then it will be classified as red. Now, again, the um, um, example from Bangladesh tests, holding one, we asked them as to whether they use fertilizers, they said yes. Then we asked the follow-up question of the eight measure, how many do you practice? And they, they said two, okay. And hence, based on the criteria, which I just listed here, they are classified as yellow. Now let's take another example, holding two. They said, yes, we use fertilizer. And then we asked them a follow-up question as to which practices do you uh, adhere to? And they said none. And hence this agriculture holding is considered as non-sustainable. And then another holding, holding 37, 
they are not using any fertilizer so by default they are, they are considered as green and holding number 39 they are using fertilizer but out of the eight they adhere to four and hence the criteria that we have set for this indicator based on that they're, they're classified as desirable or green and the last step remain the same so we aggregate the agriculture area by green yellow and red statuses and then using the total agriculture area of the country we then calculate these uh, proportions or percentages so management of uh, pesticides this is the seventh sub indicator of sg241 the third and the um, the fourth in the environmental dimension um, the theme is pesticide risk coverage is all farm types and reference period is last calendar year uh, to contextualize, pesticides are important inputs in modern agriculture for both crops and livestock production systems. But if not well managed, they can cause harm to the people health and as well to the environment. The proposed sub indicator is based on um, um, information on the use of pesticides on the farm, the type of pesticide use and the type of measures taken to mitigate the associated risk. So the, there are three things, okay? Like, like in case of uh, um, fertilizers, we first see as to whether this particular agriculture holding is using fertilizer or not, okay? Uh, sorry, pesticide or not. So if the holding is not using pesticide, we classify that particular holding as green because that holding is not contributing negatively to the environment. If the holding is using pesticide, then we ask a follow-up question as to which type of pesticide are you using, okay? And then based on the type of pesticide that the holding is using, then we uh, recommend the holding to adopt um, uh, some of these measures, both uh, health-related for the for the human beings and environmental related so again i'm not going to go through this you can read it for yourself these are very self-explanatory but of course i mean we will come back to this uh in any questions so green yellow and red statuses so let me let me start with the with with, with the la with the last in the green so the farm will be automatically classified as green if they are not using pesticide. Again, visualize this problem from the point of view of negative impact of fertilizer usage on the environment. So if the farm is not using pesticide for any reason, affordability, high prices, non-availability, no access, etc. So the reasons could be multiple. But if the farm is not using it, the farm is classified as, as green. However, if the farm uses only moderately or slightly hazardous pesticides, so we have two categories of pesticides. One is moderately or slightly hazardous pesticides. And then the second one is highly or extremely hazardous pesticides. These two classes of pesticides are defined by the World Health organization and uh, the link to the to the guidelines for this classification is given in the SDG 241 methodological note as well as in the support documents so you can find the definition of what do we mean by moderately or slightly hazardous and highly or extremely hazardous pesticides anyway coming back to the green so if the farm use moderately or slightly hazardous pesticide, which is World Health Organization class two and class three, in this case, the holding adheres to all three health related measures, so these ones, which are adherence to label direction for pesticide use, maintenance and cleansing of protection equipment after, after use, and safe disposal of, uh, of uh, pesticide waste, that is cartons, bottles, and bags. So in this case, the farm should adhere to all three health related measures. And at least four out of the seven environmental related measures. Okay. So 
three from these, all three, and four from the seven for the farm to be classified as green if it is using moderately or slightly hazardous pesticide. Okay. Now, the farm is classified as yellow if it only uses moderately or slightly hazardous pesticide, again, WHO class two and three, and take at least two measures each from health and environment related. Okay. So instead of three and four, which was the case in green, for yellow, the farm needs to qualify two from here and two from here. And the farm will be classified as red if it uses highly or extremely hazardous pesticides, which is WHO class um, 1A or 1B or illegal pesticides, okay? So if the farm is using highly or extremely hazardous pesticide or illegal pesticide by default, it's green, uh, it's, it's, it's red, sorry. Or if it is used moderately or slightly hazardous pesticide without taking specific measure to mitigate environment or health related risk associated with their use, fewer than two from each category. So in case of, uh, in case of red, if the farm is using moderately or slightly hazardous pesticide, if they are, you know, adhering to less than two of my two of um, these uh, three measures and less than two from the seven measures, then it will be classified as as red. So let's go to the example, and it will further clarify as to as to what uh, these uh, threshold means. So the Bangladesh test, we interviewed holding for this uh, sub indicators. We asked them as to whether they use pesticide or they don't use it. As you can see, majority of them said, yes, we use pesticide. Then the follow up question was, which type of uh, pesticides do you use? Highly or extremely hazardous or illegal or moderately or slightly hazardous? Okay, so this is the second question. So then if depending on their answer, then we ask them about the measures. So which measures do you adopt? So in this case, this holding is using highly and extremely hazardous or illegal pesticides. So by default, no matter if this holding is adhering to all three health related and all seven environment related measures, still it will be classified as as uh, non-sustainable or red. Holding two, they said, yes, we use pesticides. We use moderately or slightly hazardous uh, type. They adhere to two from the environmental measures and two from the health measures. And hence this uh, holding and its associated agriculture area will be classified yellow or acceptable. Now go to, let's go to um, another one. So number 12. So this holding said, yes, we use pesticide. The type that we use is moderately or slightly hazardous. They adhere to three environment related and um, three um, health related measures. And hence this agriculture holding was classified as desirable. And the last step, Again, is the same. I mean, we then start aggregating the agriculture area by green, yellow, and red um, colors or uh, sustainability statuses. And then uh, we use the nationally representative agriculture area to calculate the proportions for this particular sub indicator. So, any questions? We don't have. Any for now, maybe we we'll wait a few seconds and then you can move on. Okay, so let me cover the next one and then yes. perhaps we will, we will take yeah. questions together. So the last sub indicator in the environmental dimension is the use of agro biodiversity supportive practices. Uh, this sub indicator, let me highlight, was subject to intense discussion and, um, and event, 
eventually refinement in 2019 is part of the 2020 comprehensive review of the global indicator framework. Um, these refinements uh, were carried out in consultation with a country led working group constituted by FAO. Uh, it was coordinated by Canada and uh, other countries uh, represented in that group were Brazil, USA, Argentina, Chile, France, and Russia. So after an year long discussions and consultation um, uh, throughout 2019, towards the very end of the year, a compromise consensus on the indicators criteria was reached, after which it was tabled again for IAEG SDG review, where the group reapproved and re endorsed this particular sub indicator in November 2019. Um, from methodological perspective, this sub indicator measures the level of adoption of agro biodiversity supportive practices by the agriculture holding at ecosystems, species, and genetic level for both crops and livestock. One important point that I would uh, emphasize is that specifically in case of this sub-indicator, the scope um, is the entire uh, area of the farm holding as opposed to the agriculture land area that is used as a, as a denominator for, for all other indicators, okay? So up until now, um, for all the sub indicators, we were using agriculture land area as the denominator. Particularly for this one, we are going to take the entire farm, uh, entire area of the agriculture holding. So this, uh, this, this is very important to take note of. Now, um, so based on whether certified organic agriculture is practiced at a country level, two set of criteria were proposed. One for countries, countries practicing traditional agriculture and another one for countries where organic agriculture certification system is in place. So these were the list of the criteria that were decided after thorough del deliberations with, with the group of countries that I just mentioned, of which um, some are uh, represented here in this virtual training as well, uh, like say, for example, Brazil, Argentina, and Chile. Um, so, so these were the set of the criteria for countries with no organic certification or tra practicing traditional agriculture. And then um, the same set, so all other remains the same from the previous slide. The only one additional criteria added for the countries with organic agriculture is farm produces agri agriculture products that are organically certified or its products are undergoing the certification process applies only to countries with, with, with organic certification. And then based on the set of criteria, okay, um, we classify the agriculture area of the farm, you know, um, uh, based on, based on the, the following, uh, based on the following thresholds. So sustainability status for countries with organic certification in place in that case, the agriculture holding meets at least three of the above criteria. So of the six, the country needs to adhere to three of these criteria for it to be classified as green. Yellow, the agriculture holding meets at least one of the above criteria, then it will be classified as yellow. And if the agriculture holding meets none of the above criteria, then it will be classified as red. Um, for the countries with no organic certification, because we have we are proposing one less measure, um, in this case, the agriculture holding meets at least two of the above criteria. Okay, two of the five. Yellow agriculture holding meets at least one of the above criteria and red if the agriculture holding meets none of the above criteria. And the last step remains the same. 
we assign the agriculture farm and uh, the agriculture area that it owns manages and operates um, sustainability statuses based on uh, um, based on the fulfillment uh, of the of the thresholds that we have set for uh, for this sub indicator so i stop here oh. go through the you know yeah. so the, this one the wage rate in agriculture so in the social dimension, now we have completed with the environmental dimension. We entered into the, the last dimension of SDG 241 framework. Um, we have three sub indicators in this dimension of which the first one is wage rate in agriculture. Uh, so this theme, which is on decent employment, provide information on the compensation of unskilled employees working for the farm that belongs to the elementary occupation group as defined by the international standard classification of occupation by by ILO international labor organization um, in other words uh, this uh, sub indicator informs about economic risks faced by unskilled workers those who perform simple and routine tasks in terms of average uh, remuneration received. So we are not focused here on skilled labor force, but on the labor force, which is doing basic and uh, routine uh, activities on the, on the agriculture holding. So the formula for uh, estimation of the wage rate that is getting paid to the unskilled uh, worker on the farm holding is very simple. I mean, uh, if you have access to the daily wage, the daily average wage rate paid to the unskilled labor, that is very good. Otherwise, usually um, um, the, the holder or the respondent doesn't have information on the, on the daily wage rate. So what they provide you is, is the total annual compensation. And from the total annual compensation, we divide it by the total number of animals hour worked and multiply it by eight to convert into days. So it's, uh, it's very simple. And the sustainability criteria that we have developed for this particular sub indicator are as follows. So the farm will be classified as green. If the wage rate paid to unskilled labor is above the national wage rate or minimum agriculture sector wage rate if available. And a default result for farms which are not hiring any 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 labor. Um, the farm will be classified as yellow if the wage rate paid to unskilled labor is equal to the minimum national wage rate or minimum agriculture sector wage rate if available. And will be classified as red if the wage rate paid to the unskilled labor is below the national minimum wage rate or minimum agriculture se sector wage rate if available. And the last step, I mean, again, is, is, is the same, uh, which, which, which I explained earlier. So we calculate the proportions using the nationally representative agriculture area of the country to, uh, to derive the sustainability statuses for, uh, for this, uh, for this sub indicator. So I stop here. So let's now go to the the tenth sub indicator in the uh, in the framework of SDG two for one. Now, FIES is already a tier one SDG indicator, which is indicator two point one point two, and uh, uh, tier one means uh, established methodology exists, and data on it is regularly collected by countries and is reported by FAO. Now, in context of 241, it's customized or tailors, tailored version um, tries to measure the extent to which household of the holder or owner of the farm are food secure despite having some agriculture production. So I will not go into the details uh, of how to estimate the severity of food insecurity using FIES. First, assuming that many of you may know about this indicator already. And secondly, because of the because of the shortage uh, of time that um, that we are having now, 
However, I will touch upon the basics of its methodology while referring you to the training material on the indicator that is published by, by FAO. In short, uh, FIES is the measure uh, of, um, uh, is the metric of severity of food insecurity that is measured at the household level. It's a statistical measurement scale designed to measure unobservable or latent traits uh, and is measured based on people direct um, uh, yes or no answer to the eight FIES questions. So um, here are the eight standard FIES questions that are used to collect data on the food insecurity of the household of the holder of the agriculture holding. Um, I will again refrain from going into details of explaining each question, a detailed explanation on what this question um, uh, entails is given in the PDF file that, uh, that will be shared with you as part of this presentation. So once the data on the eight FIES question is collected, the first step is to prepare the data for analysis, um, where the standard labels are added to the eight FIES questions, um, uh, which I will show to you on the second slide. As a second step, the data is inputted into the model prepared by the FAO FIES team for uh, parameter estimation that is calculation of a level of severity of food insecurity associated with each question and each respondent, respondent using a rush model. Um, in total, two parameters are estimated. The first one is called the item parameter, which, in, uh, which we also technically call the difficulty parameter. And it refers to and uh, is derived from the eight FIES questions. And then we have the respondent parameter, which we also call the ability parameters. These are derived from the number of people who responded to the, to the eight FIES question. The third step is statistical validation, where an assessment is made as to whether, depending on the quality of data collected, the estimated parameters are valid, that is, uh, the data are consistent with theoretical assumptions that, uh, that, that are used to inform the model. And finally, as a, as a last step, the calculation of sustainability status of the agriculture holding is carried out. Um, so once a measure of severity of food insecurity condition experienced by each respondent, that is uh, the holder of the agriculture holding, um, based on their answer to the eight questions has been derived. The sustainability status um, is assigned to the holding uh, like we were doing for the other uh, sub-indicators. So we assign uh, desirable, acceptable, and non-sustainable uh, statuses accordingly. So let me elaborate the step described on the previous slide. So based on the data collected uh, using the eight FIES questions, it is prepared for analysis first, where each data item is coded, where two is assigned for a no response and one is assigned for, uh, for yes. After the coding, the standard labels are added to the eight FIES question as per the model developed by the FAO FIES team. So instead of the question codes that we had on the previous slide. And these will vary from, you know, based on the survey from one country to another. We add the standard labels, worried, healthy, few food, skipped, ate less, run out, hungry, whole day, etc. So once the data has been uh, properly codified and standard labels are added to the uh, data of the eight FIES questions, the next step implies estimating the parameters associated with the eight, uh, with the eight uh, questions. The methodology underlying the estimation of parameters for the prevalence of severity of food insecurity is based on the item response theory or IRT 
which is uh, used to analyze responses to the survey or test questions. Now, the IRT is a quantitative measure of non-observable uh, traits that I uh, previously mentioned uh, that can be derived from a set of uh, dichotomous variables uh, uh, or binary variables that takes a value one or zero. Now, Rush model is one of the several model in the item response theory, um, which is applied to the, to the FIAS data. So once uh, the model is, uh, is um, uh, executed, I mean, the analysis is carried out, the item parameters or difficulty parameters are estimated using the model and arranged from least severe, which is, uh, which is worried, to the most severe, which is uh, if you are hungry for the entire day, for the whole day. Thereafter, the respondent parameters are estimated from the raw score. The raw score is also estimated by the model. The raw scores are a number of affirmative uh, or yes responses given to the eight PS questions. Raw score is an integer number with a value between zero and eight. Thus, the total uh, number of respondent parameters are, are nine. So, you know, depending on how many questions the um, holder of the agriculture holding has responded to, um, we can have a raw score from zero to from zero to eight. So this is this is how the output of the model uh, looks like, um, whereby, um, as you can see here, we have the ability parameters here. These are the standard errors. These are the number of, uh, of agriculture holdings that said yes to a particular question. And um, this is the expected score. So based on the uh, information that we have uh, estimated using the model, all what we do is we plug in the item severity, raw score and respondent parameters uh, into the standard metric or an Excel sheet that is prepared by FAO into appropriate places. So the difficulty parameters are plugged into the, to the Excel sheet at appropriate place, which can be, this Excel sheet can be accessed here. And likewise, the ability parameters are plugged into the respective place within the, within the Excel sheet, along with the standard errors and the number of uh, uh, the, the frequency of the of the agriculture holdings to estimate the the value the final values for the fierce uh, sub indicator so in this case these two values which is 12.2 and 2.3 are the two values for the for the FIAS indicator 2.1.2. So the prevalence rate, moderate and um, um, uh, severe food insecurity is 12.2% while the prevalence rate for severe food insecurity is 2.3% uh, uh, from the data that we gathered in, in, in Bangladesh. Now there is one additional step which is classification of the agriculture holding based on the probability of the severity of food insecurity that we, we, we estimated using the model. So if the probability of the household of the holder, okay, of that particular agriculture holding um, will is, is to, to be moderate or, uh, or severe food insecure is less than 0.5, and the probability to be severe food insecure is less than 0.5, then we classify this agriculture holding as, uh, as green. If the probability of the household of the holder to be moderate to, to severe food insecure is greater than 0.5, and the probability to be severe food secure, insecure is less than 0.5, then we classify it as yellow. 
and lastly if the probability of a household of the holder of the holding to be severe food insecure is greater than 0.5 then we classify it as it as red so all the information that is needed for uh, for this particular sub indicator um, is, is is given in 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 this table so as you can see here the probability to be moderately and uh, severely food insecure for this uh, holding one is zero and the probability to be severely food insecure is zero as well so this this one is classified as desirable so let me go back here to this condition so the probability of household is less than 0.5 to be moderately or severely food insecure and the probability to be severely food insecure less than 0.5. So in this case, it's, uh, it's green. So let's go to another example. Holding number four. For this household, the probability to be moderately and severely food insecure is greater than 0.5. Okay. While the probability to be severely food insecure is less than 0.5 hence we classified it as acceptable and in this case as you can see for holding 13 both the probabilities to be moderately and severely food insecure and severely insecure is greater than 0.5 hence it is classified as unsustainable now this sub indicator is easy in terms of collecting information it's a bit technical in terms of analyzing and processing information, but we have developed a very uh, logical and um, a comprehensive e-learning course on indicator 2.1.2, which is, uh, which is um, uh, we will provide you the link to that e-learning course. Uh, that is self-explanatory. Uh, after going through that course, you will, you will have a good idea as to what I spoke about uh, uh, in relation to, to the fears uh, uh, in the context of 241. Finally, once we classify the, uh, the agriculture holding and the agriculture land area that it owns, manages and operates by sustainability statuses, that is green, yellow, and red, we calculate the proportions uh, of, uh, of uh, agriculture area using the nationally representative uh, um, agriculture land area. So I will stop, stop here, Stefania. So now we, are, uh, we, we have reached uh, almost uh, the end. This is the last uh, sub-indicator within the framework of SDG 241, uh, which is secure uh, tenure rights to land. The sub-indicator allow us assessing sustainability in terms of rights over the use of agricultural land areas. Since agricultural land is a key input for agriculture production, having secure rights over land ensures that agriculture holding have control over key asset, that is land, and does not risk losing it in the short to medium term. Um, evidence shows that farmers tend to be less productive as they are reluctant to invest if they have limited access to or control of economic resources and services, particularly, particularly land. So in the context of uh, 241, here is how we uh, classify the farms and agriculture here, uh, green, yellow, and uh, red. So if the agriculture holding has a formal document with the name of the holder or the holding on it or has the right to sell or bequeath any parcel of the holding then this particular holding and its agriculture area will be classified as green the holding will be classified as yellow uh, if they still have a formal document but the name of the holder of the of the holding holding is not on it okay um, and it will be classified as red if they don't have a formal document and uh, um, the name of the of the holder or the or the holding is not on the formal document then in that case 
this holding will be classified as threat. So in for Bangladesh example, holding one, we asked them as to whether they have formal document. They said yes. We asked them as to whether your name is on the formal document. They said yes. We have a right to sell and they have a right to bequeath as well. So they are considered as desirable. Another holding, they said, yes, we have a formal document. Do, uh, my name is not on the document. I don't have the right to sell. I don't have the right to bequeath. We call this acceptable because he still has a formal document. And then the last one, you don't have a formal document. You know, of course, if you don't have a formal document, your name doesn't appear anywhere. You don't have the right to sell and you don't have the right to bequeath and hence you are classified as non sustainable. And the last step remains the same. We aggregate the agriculture areas of the farm classified as green as yellow and as red and then divided by the nationally representative agriculture area to estimate the proportions. And with this, I would like to thank everyone. And if you have any questions, uh, any clarity, I mean, um, please ask us now, or you can always write to us, uh, you know, using uh, the following email addresses. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Asfandiar. So we still don't have uh, Martin. Um, uh, so, or we go through the next presentation. So we start a new uh, chapter, let's say, or or maybe you can show the the web page, which is still something uh, interesting for the uh, participants. Show you the the my screen. And then I will show you as to where you can find more information on on uh, on both the land tenure indicator and the fees, which is two one two. Okay, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, so for the indicator on land tenure. It's a five A one, okay. But you know, it's a it's a separate indicator in its own right. It's customized and tailored for SDG two four one. But all these questions, which our colleagues from Brazil uh, um, and and other countries are asking in terms of why we have selected selling and bequeathing as a as a condition, why only formal document with even without the name of the owner on it. All this can be, you know, can be um, is detailed, uh, you know, here um, uh, on, on on this page. So you can you can go to the metadata, and then you can go to the measuring individual. Sorry. Okay, let's go there. Yeah. And and then you can you can look look through all these uh, all these um, background documents for you to for you to have more understanding. And plus we have this e-learning course as well, okay, which you can take and uh, then familiarize yourself more with the concept of uh, of land tenure. In terms of uh, two one two, which is uh, severity of food insecurity. All the information on the metadata, tier classification, um, e-learnings, and and other requisite information can be can be can be found here. So this is just to show you that if you are interested in, if you have more questions, you know that you need to uh, have answers to, then you can always go to these uh, additional resources or write to us, and we will be happily. Um, answering those. So in this session, we will cover in detail the data collection tools that have been developed by FAO to support countries in their data collection and reporting efforts on SDG 241. 
uh, as uh, highlighted uh, yesterday and today as well, the focus of SDG 241 is to assess the sustainability of farm holdings and its agriculture land area. And thus, Farm Survey offers an opportunity for collecting data through a single instrument, um, which, is, which is recommended by FAO2. The decision to use Farm Survey is in line with the country's effort, which are supported by FAO, of course, to develop Farm Survey as the most appropriate tool for generating agriculture statistics. Um, the choice of Farm Survey uh, was made because of the following reasons. Farm survey does exist in countries in one shape or form or another to collect data on different aspects of the agriculture sector. Use of farm survey will help collect information on all sub indicators using one single data collection instruments, thus avoiding the, the additional work of integrating information from different data sources that are usually managed by different institutions and organizations. Um, third, using the farm survey, all information will be collected from holdings selected through a nationally representative sample, thus avoiding the problem associated with the use of different data sources. And fourth, farm survey is expected to be cost effective in comparison to putting in place monitoring systems, that is soil and wa water sampling and laboratory testing, geographical information systems and robust administrative record systems. Um, however, uh, though farm surveys are well suited to measure the economic dimension of sustainability, it may not be the ideal tool for measuring environmental and social sustainability of the holding. Typically, um, environmental impacts of agriculture are measured through monitoring systems, which I just spoke about, like remote sensing, water, water and soil sampling, um, uh, and, and other tools. In addition, we do understand that for several environmental themes, it is unlikely that farmers will be uh, able to assess the environmental as uh, impact of their farming practices on issues like fertilizer pollution or pesticides side use, etc. So um, similarly, the information in the social dimension themes is generally captured through household surveys, while in the majority of the cases, agriculture farm holdings are closely associated with a given whole household. This is not always the case and therefore care must be given to capturing this information through dedicated survey design. Having said that, the methodological note of SDG 241 does offer the countries uh, the flexibility of, uh, of using combination of uh, different data sources other than farm surveys called alternative data sources. So in case of 241, we, have, uh, we, we offer um, the first approach, which is farm survey. It's, uh, we have all uh, we have developed a standalone farm survey questionnaire model that I will show you in a bit. Plus, we have also developed um, an option uh, around agri-survey program and 50 by 2030 initiative questionnaire that we will cover in detail tomorrow. And then I spoke briefly about the alternative data sources, which can be potentially used to report on different sub-indicators of 241 and the methodological note of of, of the indicator uh, mention alternative data sources, but this option hasn't been developed fully as yet. So we currently as FAO are in process of uh, working on, um, on uh, um, this solution to report on SDG 241. Hopefully we, we think that the guidelines, practical guidelines on how countries can use these different data sources to report on 241 will be available by the end of 2021. So let me explain in turn as to what we mean by these different options. So option one is a standalone uh, farm survey uh, questionnaire. It's designed as a module that contains the minimum set of questions needed to assess uh, SDG 241. Um, it is uh, flexible, it can be administered independently or attached as a separate module or 
It can be integrated at appropriate places within existing farm service that are um, um, uh, operational at the national level. Now, for us to develop this uh, standalone survey questionnaire for 241, we carried out cognitive tests of the, of the questionnaire in, in Mexico, Bangladesh, and Rwanda back in 2017 and 18. The objective was to, um, to refine the survey questionnaire from the design flow, comprehension, recall, and respondent judgment perspective, and to assess if the questions asked are sufficient and fully understood by a limited number of uh, heterogeneous respondents. As well, we carried out extended tests in, in Bangladesh that I was referring to during my presentation uh, uh, today and yes, uh, yesterday. So uh, in Bangladesh, <clears throat> uh, we carried out these ex extended tests to collect data to test the sustainability criteria, assess time of the survey, which on average was uh, approximately 50 minutes. In some cases, it took us longer than 50 minutes, but um, you know, more or less, uh, th that was the time uh, which uh, which took the surveyors to interview the um, the respondents. And of of course, one of the key um, uh, objective of the extended test in Bangladesh was to revise the support documents uh, that accompany the, the standalone survey questionnaire. Now the, the survey questionnaire has five sections. Um, we have an introductory section, then the second um, section is about uh, estimation of area of the holding. The third section has all the questions rega regarding um, the three sub-indicators of the economic dimension. The Section four has all the questions required for estimation of the environmental dimension, and section five has all the questions um, addressing the social dimension of the holding. So this is how the survey module look like. Um, we have shared it with you already as part of the link that was sent by, by us um, uh, maybe a week earlier, but we will happily share, you know, the, the survey module once again with you for uh, for your information. So, as I mentioned, we have also developed the support documents um, that 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 again, let me reiterate, were shared with you before the training. So, the support document includes an enumerator manual um, to train the enumerators, surveyors, and supervisors before their field deployment to administer the questionnaire. Um, it, this um, manual also has definition of the key terms, concepts, and meaning behind the question asked. Uh, it provides guidance on the use of skip questions and filter questions, and provide examples of com commonly encountered instances where questions and responses may not be easily may not be easy to administer and record uh, respectively. Then we have uh, a manual on uh, data into operation and analysis. It contains all the steps that must be performed in order to organize the collected data into Excel spreadsheets or other statistical packages. Um, it also includes uh, the processes and procedures to analyze the data collected and construct the 11 sub-indicators according to the dashboard approach. Then uh, we have uh, guidelines on, on data analysis and reporting. Um, this is uh, for use uh, uh, for use of both uh, data producers and uh, data users. Um, and uh, it gives the step-by-step -step um, process on how to calculate the thresholds and uh, final um, uh, sub-indicators according to the dashboard um, approach and as well the aggregate indicator. Then we have a document on sampling guidance for uh, SDG 241 
And uh, we have also developed this statistical toolkit, which comprises of a code book, tabulation plan, and modular status scripts to support, uh, support data analysis. So I'm not going to go into the detail of, uh, of all these um, um, documents because I already explained that and you can always go through this, uh, you know, it's part of the presentation. So here are the, are the documents that I was just talking about, the enumerator manual data interpretation, sampling guidance, data analysis document, et cetera, which I just spoke about. The second option, which I showed you on my very first slide is that we have integrated the questions from 241 uh, questionnaire into Agris survey program and uh, 50 by 2030 initiative, initiative uh, survey questionnaire. Now, um, the, the questions from 241 um, uh, survey module have been integrated into the core and um, core module, as well as into the economy and production methods and environment module of the agri survey program, and as well into the production methods and environment module of the 50 by 2030 initiative. I'm not going to go again into the detail of, uh, of, uh, of this slide because we have a full fledged presentation scheduled for tomorrow, which is going to, uh, which is going to elaborate more as to what uh, agri survey program and 50 by 2030 constitute um, um, for, uh, for uh, SDG 241 in terms of data collection. So here are the different documents uh, on the Agris uh, survey program. Uh, we call it a handbook on agriculture integrated survey. And then we have also prepared a technical note on mainstreaming uh, SDG indicator 241 in uh, Agris and 50 by 2030 initiative. Now, as I mentioned earlier, the methodological note of SDG 241 um, does recommend using alternative data sources to report on um, uh, to report on the indicator. However, several aspects needs to be carefully considered prior to using alternative data sources. Um, in order to produce consistent and reliable data as per recommended periodicity, it is advised that the use of alternative data sources may be considered when the available data set fulfill uh, certain criteria. So anyways, I will go through those criteria in my next uh, slide. But here, you know, for, uh, for the different sub indicators of 241, some potential alternative data sources have been, uh, have been uh, recommended, but the countries can only use it if these alternative data sources fulfill uh, certain criteria. So first of all, uh, the alternative data uh, sources uh, should give the results of at least the same quality as the survey and ensure international comparability. Um, it should respect the recommended certification, that is the farm type, um, sector and production systems, uh, and, and that is if the data is available at the same level of territorial desegregation as farm surveys, et cetera. It should capture the same phenomena as um, uh, proposed by the farm survey um, that is described in the sub-indicator metadata sheets um, with at least uh, uh, a documented uh, same quality uh, and considered uh, and considered standards. Uh, it is compliant with, um, as I mentioned, international national standards and classification systems to be uh, to be internationally comparable. And finally, the reference year and periodicity should be homogeneous across the different uh, sub indicators. Now, um, having said that. Um, Alternative data sources can be used to complement and 
and or validate farm service data. This combined approach has the potential to improve the validity and soundness of the results, in particularly in countries that have well-established monitoring systems and uh, that are able to produce quality information consistently over time. The information from other sources may be used and leveraged in different ways, depending on the quality and regularity of its uh, uh, collection. For example, it can be used to replace farm survey questions where alternative data sources of information are available and respond to the criteria mentioned on the, on the previous slide. It can also complement farm survey questions by providing additional contextual information helpful to interpret the results. Uh, and as well, it can be used to cross check the farm survey result to identify any inconsistencies and to ensure the robustness of the indicator. Um, the validation exercise um, can be done um, ex post, that is during the data collection uh, by providing uh, external uh, data to the enumerators before going to the field. In this way, the enumerator can probe whether the responses to the farm survey are consistent with a priori external knowledge. In any case, it is recommended that country complement the farm survey with uh, monitoring systems or other sources of information um, that can measure the impact of agriculture on the environment. Um, this will provide additional information and help cross check the robustness of SDG indicator 241 with regards to the environmental dimension of, uh, of, uh, of sustainability. So with this, uh, I stop here. We will uh, discuss in more detail uh, as for our future work on alternative data sources uh, tomorrow. And um, if you have any question regarding, uh, uh, you know, the data collection tool for uh, for SU two four one, please uh, don't hesitate to ask any question. Yeah, this one. Okay. You see the correct uh, one, right? Yes. Okay. So, uh, Aspania, maybe you you can you check the, the the comments on the chat if people are asking uh, other questions just to follow a little bit. Okay. So um, we have seen so far all the theoretical parts. And notions so we understand the year, and we have just seen the data collection tools. So let's now move to another practical part, and I will show you now how FAO gets the data on SDG two for one for countries. Meaning, I will show you now the questionnaire, which you might have all received uh, on August tenth, twenty twenty, this August, and it is expected to be sent back uh, to us by the end of this month. So we have one single question that comes in Excel format, and it is indeed the key instrument to collect uh, the data from countries. It covers all the three dimensions and all the 11 sub indicators that we have seen uh, uh, yesterday and today. It is sent to countries once a year, even if we have seen that the periodicity uh, of the indicator is three years. But in this way, we can monitor the availability of data on annual basis, since uh, you know very well it is really a brand new indicator. Identify, identify changes and get the data points through the years, considering also that often we do not get many data, especially now that we are at the starting phase. Assess the country needs in terms of capacity development, for example, technical assistance and training on the SDG, exactly how we did for this uh, virtual training. And lastly, confirm the national focal points contacts, which is always a crucial information for us uh, so that we are sure to be immediately in contact with the appropriate person. What we have done so far, we have tested the question in 45 countries through a pilot exercise that was carried out between December 19 and April 2020. I was supposed to show you the results of this pilot test right after this presentation, 
but I'm afraid we will not have time. So uh, maybe you can go through the presentation alone, or if I have time tomorrow, maybe I show you quickly uh, a couple of slides, the most important ones. Initially, the question was only in English, and we have translated uh, uh, in July 2020 into three official languages, or the three UN official languages, which are Arabic, French, and Spanish. Then we have had our first hospital dispatch, as I said, on August 10th of this, month, this, this year. We have sent the question to 203 countries, including your countries, of course. And the questionnaire has been sent to the SDG 241 focal points, to the general SDG focal points, and to the heads of NSO. We have copied the FAO offices and all the relevant people. And the deadline, as I said, is for the 30th of September. Next activity will be to translate uh, into the remaining UN official languages, which are uh, Chinese and uh, Russian. Yeah, it is shown how the questionnaire is organized. So it is composed of eight worksheets. There are three introductory sections, which are the cover page instructions and the definitions. Then we have three data reporting sections, one for each dimension, and two supplementary information sections for metadata and feedback. We are going to see all this in detail in a minute. This is a preview on how the questionnaire is displayed. You can see all the different sheets uh, here. So in detail, what are these sections about? The first one, the cover page, asks country-specific information, meaning the national focal point contact details, that as I said, is really key information for us for having smooth communication with the country. Then there is a page with only instruction on how to complete the questionnaire, and it gives also an overview of the questionnaire structure, followed by another page that explains the definition of the key concepts in and terms uh, and the international standard used. The second section is the core of the questionnaire, where the data are requested, meaning where the countries fill the spaces with their data. And this includes all the three dimensions. So the three sub indicators for the economic, the five for the environmental, and the three for the social. This is how it is displayed, but I'm going to show you quickly uh, right after uh, this presentation, the real questionnaire. Last section, we said it's about the supplementary information. So the metadata part is quite intuitive. It collects metadata on country coverage, source of data, unit of measurement, frequency of data collection, and so on. And finally, the feedback sheet, that is a very simple survey with 10 questions that help us understanding if some areas maybe still need improvements. Now let me show you how to fill the Excel properly. The first page, so the cover page is like this one. You need to fill this column with the national focal point contact details. And we ask this information even if uh, it, has, it has already been sent to FAO in the past. Because this will tell us if the focal point has been confirmed or if uh, uh, he or she has been changed. About that, these are the focal points contact detail we have for your countries. Please let us know in case you know that they have been changed. Uh, in particular, also for Venezuela, we still need uh, the uh, nomination. And we have also maybe uh, an issue or an, a doubt on Mexico, because we have received uh, last May the communication from INEGI. Uh, that INEGI uh, was the focal point to FAO, so it was in charge of answering the questionnaire. And they were supposed to include the data both from INEGI and SIAP. Uh, while two weeks ago, we have received the questionnaire back from SIAP with, on this, with only SIAP data. So I have indicated in this slide all the three focal points, Mrs. Ruiz, uh, Mr. Espejo, and Mr. Loaiza. But I'm not sure since the, from the last communication, actually I should consider only Mrs. Ruiz. 
so I kindly ask Mexico uh, to clarify uh, this. For the three data reporting sections, you have to fill two columns. The first column needs to be filled with the values following uh, these described criteria. We ask only one year, so you should report the most recent one that is available in your country. The reference uh, uh, we use in the, is the calendar year from January to December. If you have no data, uh, you can insert uh, zero if it is not occurring but potentially applicable, while you should write NA if it is not applicable at all. While in the second column, so which is the note, you should insert explanation in case the data reported uh, use a different national definitions, so not the ones described in the definition worksheets, or if the data are reported using a different reference period, so not the calendar year from January to December. And here you also specify the exact year that the data are referring to. So if you have filled the first column with the value, in the notes you write the year. This last point applies, uh, of course, to this data collection cycle. Uh, since we are not sure for, for which year you may have data, and uh, uh, that is also to facilitate the collection of all currently available data. Or maybe for one or two indicators, you might have last data available from, uh, for example, 2015, which is still good for us, but it's important to underline it. And just for future note, uh, FAO typically collects data for specific years, so usually the last four to five years. And probably this question will include such options in the coming years. So once, of course, the process becomes uh, more established. The metadata section is composed by a table with uh, all the 11 sub-indicators listed and the columns where you can specify all the metadata. So the type of variables, the availability, unit or measurement, and so on. And the last section is the feedback one. Uh, so as I said, 10 questions, among them there are six questions with the scale response from strongly agree to strongly disagree, and four open questions to say something more in details in case uh, uh, you need it. Uh, that's all uh, as far as the data collection question is concerned. Maybe, uh, uh, I don't know if there are already some questions, if not, let me show you quickly, uh, let me stop sharing, and I share, as far as I don't know if there are some questions. So in case not, I will show, this is, uh, so let's proceed. Sorry? Uh, can you hear me? Yes, now yes. Okay, so I was saying that we don't have any questions so far, so let's proceed. Okay, perfect. So yeah. uh, so let me show you quickly uh, the real survey. This is the, the, the real question. This is the question you have all received. Uh, just in case you didn't receive it, uh, uh, at least the focal point that I shown didn't receive it, please let us know. So you see here below, you have all the different uh, uh, sheets. Uh, the first one, the cover page, it gives you uh, this space, and here you have also other extra information, for example, our contacts uh, and all the details when you have sent back, etc. You have then the instruction. You see how it is structured, so you have uh, different paragraphs where it is really explained uh, everything, including the, all the structure of the question, the questionnaire, uh, including all the uh, sheets that I just shown to you. The definition is uh, the most important, uh, probably, sheet because it gives you really a lot of information. Uh, you see, it is divided by subject. We are we have the denominator, and then uh, you have the sub indicator by sub indicator all the definition, the terms used, and the international standards used. So it is a very long uh, sheet. 
but in case you have any doubt, you go here and you can see quickly uh, if the information that you need is here. Then it comes uh, uh, the three uh, uh, dimension sheets are coming. So uh, we have an economic one, the environmental one, and the social one. Uh, here as well, it's divided by sub indicator. So it's quite intuitive. You have the three for the uh, economic and uh, uh, the same for environmental and the social. You have the columns, so you see you have the colors, you have the unit of measurement, and then, as I explained, you have the two columns that needs to be filled. And the same for the, the social dimension. Here again, you have uh, explained uh, a little bit how to fill this uh, uh, sheet, and you have also the indication on the uh, methodology used, so the, the PDF that you can download, even in Spanish, this has been translated in Spanish. Then uh, the metadata, as I explained, you see, you have uh, the different uh, sub-indicators, always divided by sub-indicators, and you have the different columns where you can insert all the metadata, of course, if you have them and uh, always there is a space for notes in case you want to add something that could be relevant for us. And then the last, the last uh, section, which is the feedback. Very simple questions. These uh, questionnaires, these questions will help us understanding if we can improve the questionnaire even more uh, and next year when we are going to send uh, the questionnaire again. And then you, of course you have a free space to say whatever you want. But don't forget that we are always open to listen your suggestions. So use uh, this uh, email address, sdg241 uh, mm, line indicator at fao.org, and uh, uh, you will reach us uh, immediately. Uh, I showed everything about the questionnaire. I hope everything was clear. Do we have any question, Asfandiar? Uh, so I switch on my camera. It's dark here in the meantime. I don't know, maybe um, it's, like it's already 7.30 here. Uh, of course, always, if you have any question, you, will, uh, uh, are, you are free to tell us tomorrow in case you have questions, other questions. Uh, we uh, skipped quite a lot of sessions even today, uh, so we will coordinate with us Pandayar how to, to deal the, the last day, because for sure we, we need to select uh, uh, some presentation to really be skipped. For sure we will have the uh, AGRIS colleague coming to present the AGRIS program and the 50 by 2030 initiative, and we will have for sure the Canada experience, which I think uh, it's very interesting for you because it's really uh, a, a practical example of one country. Do you want to add something, Espandier? No, that's it. But uh, this training is, uh, you know, for you to better understand uh, what we talked about yesterday and today, uh, especially about the framework, about the 11 sub indicators. So I would strongly suggest to you to read through the methodological note once more, because uh, that's where a lot of other questions that you may have may surface. Plus, you know, the support documents uh, that, I, that I was mentioning in my previous presentation, the enumerator manual, the calculation procedures, the sampling guidance will give you all the necessary um, information on how to go about collecting information about this indicator, as well as on how would you then process the data for you to construct the uh, 11 sub-indicators. And uh, 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 Okay. Yeah, so, so actually, I mean, um, from, from this point of view, I mean, it's, it's just uh, the beginning of the collaboration that we are having with you. 
I mean, uh, if you have any follow up questions, you can always uh, write to us uh, using the email addresses that we showed you. And we will be happy to answer those questions and clarify any concerns that you may have. Yeah, maybe I want to add, uh, we had some questions from the registration phase from uh, Daniela Lopez, Berta Rodriguez Jara, and Diana Ramirez. And then we had some questions left from yesterday, it was from Mr. Caceres uh, Leonardo, from Eduardo Carvajal and Paula Villaroel, from Raul Valle, Raul Melo, and Beatriz uh, Urquia Rojas. And then I got an email with a question from Luis Gustavo uh, Pacheco. So we have analyzed this question, Aspandia has seen them, and he thinks that everything was answered today. So in case uh, he, we didn't answer your question, especially these people that have, I have nominated, please feel free tomorrow to ask again the question. Okay, so uh, really uh, thanks all of you again for having participated to this second day of virtual training. Today also was a very intense day. We have seen uh, uh, many content and we have finally finished to see the fulcrum of the 2 for one methodology. Uh, tomorrow we plan to have, uh, we hope to have time to, to have a more interactive session you will be asked to talk at least the, the two led representative per country. And uh, we really hope to have uh, a very pleasant uh, uh, session as we have had today and yesterday. So thanks again and uh, see you tomorrow. Bye bye to all. <laughs>